Okay, so I feel I should confess up front that I am neither a futurologist or a comedian or a playwright or anything else Mark was. And I also work for an oil and gas organization. <laughs> so I'm just gonna put that out there up front. Um, but thank you all for having me today. When I was first asked to come along and talk today um, about technology and innovation in the organization, I was gonna talk a little bit about you know, flex benefit platforms or how we're using bots just now to update our bonus information within our HRIS system or how we have online tools to help managers make smart reward decisions. But actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more holistically, I think, about culture and innovation and building on, again, something that Mark said, but you know, I do agree that culture um, beats each strategy for breakfast. So it's, it's about how Holistically, cultural changes in my organization have forced me to rethink how we do reward and more be innovative in our thinking. And yes, there's a technology element, but it is about how innovative you are in your thinking for me. So, and a health warning, this is a journey. You know, this is not an end product. I don't have all the answers here and I don't have a final solution. We are very much trying to work through this as, you know, as we engage in things like concepts like the future of work and how work will be done in the future and who will be doing work in the future. So it's something that we're learning as we're going along. So first of all, a little, a little bit quickly just about who we are as an organization. So Baker Hughes, um, a GE company, was a merger between Baker Hughes and GE Oil and Gas. We formed in July 2017. We have about 64,000 employees. Uh, we're based in 120 countries. And we are proud to say we're the first and only what we call full stream company. Our purpose is very simple. It's to invent smarter ways to bring energy to the world. And a little bit about the full stream concept. What we're trying to do in oil and gas in our organization is traditionally in an oil and gas in a services company, you're either based downstream or upstream. Um, so upstream is where you are taking the oil from the seabed and you may be on a rig or a platform. Downstream is when you're refining that onshore into a usable product. So we do both. We do everything from seabed to surface. And again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of information here, but this is some of the products we have in our portfolio, upstream, downstream, and midstream. And I just wanted to emphasize that we do have a big digital agenda. So technology for us is very important in everything we do in the organization. Um, and we're looking at some of the different concepts like brilliant factories, you know, data, predictions, analytics, how we use that, machine learning, artificial learning, uh, the concept of digital twins as well. So technology is very big for us as an organization. So a little bit as well, uh, you know, to set a context about our culture. When we formed the organization back in July 2017, the merger happened we put together our cultural pillars. So we had a set of GE beliefs from the GE side, and we had a set of values from the Baker Hughes side. We wanted to have something that was very unique to ourselves as one organization. So you can see here, you know, it's a, it's a focus on customer outcomes, connecting and investing each other, leading in all ways, collaboration, and also inventors. So again, focusing on how we can be disruptive in our thinking, how can we use technology, how can we be innovative and use practical um, new thinking and, and drive to do things differently. So that is key for us as we go forward. And this slide, I just want to show us a little bit about how we engage with our employees. So yes, we have the whole cultural um, pillars and the focus there, but it's also as well about our employee experience. So the daily interactions employee have, um, the employee life cycle, how that works in organizations, what it's like to work for Baker Hughes. Um, how do we engage employees? We have um, concepts such as leader of choice. What, for, what makes a leader of choice? And how do we get people to be better as a leader of choice? Um, how do we get the employee voice heard, you know, grassroots from the organization as well, and also from customers, what it's like to work with us as a customer. And the last slide here is really just a little bit, and I show it just to share our, our roadmap in terms of cultural transformation, because as I say, this is a journey for us. So I go back to the GE days, 
prior to the merger. Um, and I was from the legacy GE organization. So we recognized in GE, we are a massive organization, and we had to find a way to become a simpler organization. We had to create a way that we're more agile, we're more simple, we're more faster in how to do things. And that led us into this concept of fast works. And that was about looking at things differently um, and looking at tools and behaviors to see us help us try and work things differently. And that led us to um, have a different idea in terms of how we've done performance development. It also made us rethink how we did our annual executive incentive plan. And um, it led us to rethink how we do people reviews in the organization. And also up to reimagining rewards pilot as well that we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about here. So it's all, as I say, it's a process that we're going through. It's very much a journey that we're on. So starting that, I want to talk a little bit about PD at BHGE. And PD is really just the way we grow and develop our staff. It's nothing more complicated than that. Um, traditionally in GE, we had a really dreaded appraisal process where um, once a year, an employee would sit down and go through the, the, you know, the typical appraisal where they would get um, rated against how they'd done against their goals and objectives, um, how they performed against the values in the organization. That culminated into one overall rating for the individual. Um, it was a, what we call a workflow. It was a horrendous workflow to fill in. It was huge. It was pages. It was always done in December where people really weren't interested in doing it. It was the last thing in their mind. The quarter was closing. The year end was coming up. We made people do their performance reviews at that time. And literally, honestly, it got filed in the system. It was like the equivalent of going into a drawer. And it was never seen again. And that's, we wanted to change this way of performance development. So we started a new process on PD, really to have a more flexible system. And, and a lot of the, the outcome, or the, sorry, a lot of the, the concepts are the same as we've had before, but we're just trying to do it on a more real-time basis. So now we have a process where we still have priority setting. We don't call it goals and objectives, but we ask people to look at their priorities as we go through the year. And we really want to have people focusing on where they make the biggest impact, and where they have the most contribution to customers. So it's about doing fewer things better for us. And your priorities can be short term. Um, they can be a two month priority, it can be a two year priority, or it could be a, a six month priority. And they get refreshed all the time as you go through the organization and through the year. So you're constantly talking about your priorities and where you are with them. And that happens through this third bubble where we have touch points. And a touch point is just very simply where your manager will talk to you um, about how you're going. And we're really trying to emphasize now that managers become leaders and become performance coaches. So a, a touch point can be very informal. It can literally last for two minutes or it can last for two hours. And you decide how you, frequently you want to have these. There's no regular scheduled rhythm. You decide how often you want to have a touch point as you go through um, the year. And we also have a process as well now of giving and receiving insights. So an insight, this is where we just give feedback. Typically, this is peer-to-peer -peer feedback or colleague-to-colleague. -colleague. And it's also employee-to-manager feedback as well. So using the tool that we have, we now have a system where you can go in very quickly and give an insight to someone. Maybe after they've um, done a presentation, done a project, you might want to go in and, and give them an insight. If you've seen them behave in a certain way, you might want to give them a consider insight, consider doing it differently next time, or a continue insight, continue doing this. Um, you can also, as an individual, go in and request insights. So you're encouraged to go in and ask for insights from individuals. And it's all, the insights are personal to you and they're confidential to you, but it's about helping you grow as a, a, a leader or as an individual in the organization. And all of this is underpinned by technology. We have a very simple app. Um, it's on our phones, it's on our laptops, where you can go in and just record these conversations. Um, you are definitely not writing a book. In fact, from memory, I think there's a word limit on the, 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 um, the number of words you can put in at, at any one time. But it's very simple. You're just capturing the comments, the conversations. You're going in to request insights or give insights. Um, through the use of this very simple digital app. Um, it kind of it looks like a Twitter feed when you go in. It just you know, gives you the conversation so you can see. So everything is stored within the app. 
Now, I, I talk about that because the PD, the move to PD for me as a reward professional in the organization really challenged me in two ways when it came to thinking about reward. And one of them was the whole concept, we moved to no ratings. You know, I know it's all big just now and everyone's, do you have ratings, do you not have ratings? So we took away ratings. Um, so there was that aspect, and there was also a bit about contemporizing reward itself. So if you imagine PD is very real time, it's ongoing all the time. Reward to me is almost quite a very static thing. You know, you have annual salary planning, you have annual bonus planning, and there was a bit of misalignment which were, for me was where the innovative thinking had to come in to say, oh, how do we have more of a match between the culture and what we're trying to achieve as an organization um, with the actual reward that we're doing? So I went back to our reward principles. And again, this is nothing new here. I'm sure many of you have this in your organizations as well. And we haven't changed this. You know, we always want our reward um, philosophy and our um, products and reward to be fair, to be holistic, to be market driven, transparent, nothing new there. And also there were certain things in, that I wanted to continue our compensation to, decisions to be based on. So we are a meritocracy. You know, we, we believe that there should be differentiation and we believe then that most people or the people that have the biggest impact um, on our customers should be rewarded. So we wanted to keep that aspect of differentiation there. We also recognize as well that people value lots of different rewards. Um, we, we know that people, some people will want to, for example, instead of taking a, a cash payment, will actually want to go and have a reward to have lunch with their CEO, whereas other employees would definitely do not want to go and have lunch with their CEO. So, we know that people do value different things, and we wanted to keep that flexibility in there. And we also wanted to recognize that managers have to be able to recognize performance um, throughout the year. It's not a one-time thing. So as I said, you know, this is where the challenge I saw, where in the graph on the left was very much where we traditionally were. You have a one-year appraisal, or once a year, maybe a couple of years, uh, sorry, a couple of times a year, and then you have your CMB processes that fix from there. But performance development is on time, it's real time. So you're getting real time information and real time feedback, and how do you link reward with that? Now I can tell you one of the first questions we got when we took away ratings, there was a big issue. So if I talk about that first of all, you know, every, I think every manager and every employee would put their hands up in horror and said, well, if I don't have a rating, there's no way you can decide what my salary increase is gonna be. There's no way you can decide what my bonus is going to be. Um, I and mean, there was a lot of conversations with managers about, yes, you can still make reward decisions. Um, you still know who's having the most impact, even though your employees do not have a label of a rating on them. So we went through that process, and what we did was we had a, um, we, we tested it. So we have this, we sort of started small to scale up. Um, and we tested, we have one population of employees with ratings, one population of employees with no ratings, and we looked at how managers made reward decisions or salary decisions. And we actually found that, 70, that in the no ratings population, you know, about 80% of managers could still make, obviously, salary decisions for employees, and they could still have um, good reward conversations. And we also tested to see um, what the, in the two populations, how the average bonus and how the average salary increase differed between the two populations of rating and no ratings. There really wasn't that much difference, to be honest, between the, those two populations. One of the aspects we did get from managers was the saying that sometimes, yeah, we do find it difficult to differentiate, but that came back to more of the budget we were giving them for merit reviews, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So then we moved fully to no ratings, um, and we're now in, in no ratings just now. And as I say, it's not a, it's not a perfect solution. Um, I think managers are much more comfortable with no ratings, but, and they still feel they can differentiate, but there is some loss of rigor in our overall PD system that we need to address. So this is something that we now need to look at going forward. It, it, it wasn't enough for me though. So I think when, you know, okay, the, there was a whole rate, the whole no rating situation when we dealt with that. But we also had to figure out how, how do we contemporize rewards to make that more flexible, to make it more integrated, and to make it more personalized. 
um, in the organisation. So it, again, it's this misalignment that bothered me between PD and CMB. And this is where we came up with contemporising rewards in a pilot that we were, were running just now and uh, trying to introduce into the organisation. <coughs> so I have a video um, which we used when we ran one of our, our pilot sessions, um, I think it was in India, with employees on the whole concept of um, flexible rewards and, and how employees can use it. So I'll let this run. We are a culture of learners, testers, simplifiers, and doers. While the world becomes increasingly complex, we are becoming simpler, adaptive, and more transparent. We've been transforming our culture with the GE Beliefs, FastWorks, and PD. And now we're introducing My Rewards at GE, a flexible, personalized, and contemporary approach to rewards. My Rewards at GE is a result of FastWorks at its best. We listened to you. You said rewards weren't working for you and that they didn't match our culture change. We partnered with you to understand what you value. We tested ideas and made adjustments based on your feedback. Now we have a new approach created with and for you that allows you to give, earn, and choose rewards. Like other pillars of our culture, we will continue to iterate based on what we learn works best for our employees, people leaders, and the organization. So how does My Rewards at GE work? There are three main pillars. The first is give. Give rewards to anyone. Horizontally, vertically, all that matters is that you are giving rewards based on impact. Use the PD at GE tool to send rewards. Find the rewards section in the PD tool. This is where you can choose the recipient, award amount, and write a note. Be descriptive. Tell them why. Let the person know exactly why you've given them the reward. Grab a coffee, stop by their desk. It doesn't have to be a formal meeting. Just find a few minutes to chat about the reward with them. The second pillar is earn. When you earn a reward, you will get a notification very similar to a PD Insight. Your actual reward will come to you in the form of reward credits. The third pillar is choose. After you've earned a reward, you can redeem your reward credits by selecting options from the store of offerings. The store has everything from compensation to benefits, learning and development opportunities, to work and life options, and so much more. There is something for everyone. My Rewards at GE is another opportunity for us all to grow and develop together. As we continue to test and learn, Let's work together to shape a rewards program that fits the needs of our employees and the culture that we are building. It's not perfect, it's progress. So in terms of the focus here, and again, I don't necessarily think this is anything new. I think everyone probably has an R&R &R program, but we're really trying to expand on that. We're trying to use the technology behind it to make it easy to use and encourage more employees to give peer-to-peer -peer recognition. But we're also trying to expand on the basket here. So one managers can use it at any time and people get rewards um, you know, during the year, but also we're trying to give a variety of rewards. So cash is not always king. Um, and as I said, you know, some people want to choose more learning rewards or rewards that are more as a condiment, and we're trying to see how we factor that in. It's not without its difficulties for sure. And we're also exploring this concept further, you know, even things like would people want to give off a salary increase to have more bonus? So are they willing to, you know, take a more a higher risk and leverage themselves higher and give up the salary increase? Now that in itself brings all sorts of other issues as well. But I think we just have to continue to be disruptive in rewards to figure out how we can match the culture of the organization. And very quickly, this is just our PD tool. So you can see, I'm trying to just emphasize how we integrate everything. So this, as you can see, is someone in my team, actually, where they are, you have the PD tool, the touch points, the insights, and you have the impact awards here. So you're always encouraged when you're going in, giving an insight or having a touch point, do you want to use this opportunity as well? So the technology underlies it to say, do you want to give a reward at this time? So more to come, you know, I think, on this pilot. It's not perfect, as I said, but it's something that we're continuing to push out. And the other aspect, is, and I know I'm running out of time as well, but I really just wanted to, um, 
to talk about this very quickly because this one I think is very interesting to me as a reward individual. And again, it's about this real-time rewards and how do you manage this in the organization? And I talked about this dilemma between annual cycles for salary planning, bonus planning, and you know, this continuous improvements um, and real-time insights that we now have. And, and I think what you'll find in, and certainly in my organization, and I'm sure in many, you know, we have a very standard process where we, we do people reviews of September, November. You go into your LTI planning at the end of the year. You go into bonus planning and then merit planning in January. So, you know, very cyclical. And after it's that sort of period of time, there is nothing after there. And you can be innovative, I think, in so much as, you know, when your long-term plans and your short-term plans, and we've certainly done that and tried to look at different ways and different vehicles that we have in our, our, in our LTI and our RSTI. But I think what I'm finding is that it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate um, always. So you have to sort of think about what vehicle you want to differentiate in. And the way that I'm seeing it just now, in, in, particularly in oil and gas, we've been very challenged when it comes to salary planning and salary budgets. And it's something that I spoke about earlier in terms of managers find it very difficult to differentiate when you have sort of a 2% budget to play with. So for me, we're almost moving to a process where bonus and LTI is your key differentiator. And actually, your salary planning becomes, it, it doesn't even become really a merit planning anymore. It almost becomes base pay management, where you're really trying to focus differentiation only at the very high end or at the very low end. And the bulk of your employees, I would say, you're almost looking at, you look at what your budget is for that country what, in terms of your inflation that you want to spend. You look at where the individual is in their salary range, and you move them through based on that information. We spend hours, days, weeks, months, honestly, on salary planning in the organization, sometimes giving managers a budget of 2%. And it's, to me, it, you need to, we need to be refocusing our time on where we're trying to differentiate. And I think it's more bonus and, L, and, and LTIP program where people can get bigger rewards, where they make bigger contributions. And where salary planning, really, you look at sort of base pay management approach. Um, and this, uh, I know Gartner are looking at this, and actually I just saw there's a podcast that McKinsey had just um, brought out on PD and compensation and rewards um, as well. Same type of idea where you're really looking at your, your sort of tail end of people, and that's where you differentiate on with your salary planning. So just to, to sum up very quickly, you know, we've, studies have shown that really when you have a, a salary increase or a bonus, the impact lasts for one to four weeks for that individual. So we're trying to figure out how we get that sustained engagement, how we get employee, we reach them during the year when it comes to either bonus, salary, and LTIP, or rewards and recognition. It's about that... Um, real-time in rewards as well as real-time in terms of performance development. And it's not without its issues. So again, this is something we're looking at just now. You know, how do you move to that real-time approach where I can give my managers a budget at the beginning of the year and say, hey, guys, you spend this money on bonus, on salary, on LTIP at the beginning of the year. You decide when you want to do it and how you want to do it. And I can guarantee you the bulk of them will have spent it by February. Um, you know, I, I see this on my off-cycle budget as well. So it's about how do you get good controls in place there? How does it work with pay equity as well? You know, so and how do you help them with decision points? We have dashboards. We have asking salary calculator tools that go in. They can go into and help them make smart decisions. But it's not easy. So this annual cycle versus instant rewards is not an easy thing to grasp. And I don't think we have the proper solution yet. But I think as reward professionals, it is up to us to start thinking about this. And you know, just to end, I think um, talking about, you know, thinking about the future of work, who, how work's going to be done in the future, who's going to be doing work in the future, I think we need to take a step back and reward and look at how we be more holistic and how we be more flexible and how we promote more choice um, and accessibility and reward going forward. <laughs>